Hello everyone, today we talk about the Militas as the base of the Consular Commune. As you know, I have made several videos at this point about the Militas specifically in communal Italy, and I also have a pretty hefty playlist about the latter in general, which uh, we will also keep discussing in, in general terms, but given that uh, you are interested in the historical regions uh, series as well, I'm planning, given that in fact we've been a bit too general, to start talking among the other European uh, polities in general at this point, not just lands per se, but in this case, for example, single uh, city-states. In fact, about the single Italian communes, at least introductively, and then we will keep making other videos that are a bit more um, cut for single communes, uh, mostly I discussed the most important ones, Milan, Florence, um, but actually this is a universe on its own that should be understood and it is difficult to discuss um, exactly because of the uh, multitude of the various Italian communes, so that very often from one side uh, you, you can have a, a general idea how they developed altogether because they were dramatically homogeneous with one another, right? Politically, militarily, socially, you find the same government forms, the same institutions, so much that, you know, there are various eras uh, in, uh, in Italian communal history that also are, from which also the, the, the signories, the regional states eventually developed and so on. Um, but, let's say, this, this sometimes it's too generalistic as a cat. On the contrary, when you want to study a single commune, very often you lack a single kind of history about the city throughout. Well, it, it's pretty easy actually to find information about that throughout the, the, the whole Middle Ages, but you start getting the uh, all the various nuisances of, of these centers and what they were into, really, uh, and we, we, we saw this, right, politically, uh, say, domestically and, and um, internationally, in a way, think about the Guelphs and the Ghibellines, uh, vertical and horizontal divisions, then the other chapters that, surprisingly enough, in this channel we have not dealt with, that the, the wars of the Lombard League, right, the, the first ones against Frederick Barbarossa and the other ones against Frederick uh, the Second, the Stupor Mundi, um, and, and more, right, because uh, the same struggle between the Papacy and the Empire passes through, through these cities. We made some video, actually, at this point, comprehensively about the Italian maritime republics as well, but those also we must dig into more consistently. As we will discuss in a while, I've been back on track uh, from some time, finally, after last year, and I think Schwerpunkt has been benefiting from this recently, and I hope, really, heartily, also because I like doing this, and aside from what you can't get from it, like it is just, uh, it's the same motivation, actually. But it's um, it's really also about h how much I can do, and uh, as so far I think I can. Right, so um, we are going straight to to many points that we haven't touched. I have plenty of new content, material, and interesting topics, including partly this ones, um, but really much more. Today I talk specifically about. Um, also a general topic uh, that, as you have heard, has to do with the Milites as a bit essentially the founders of the same communes. This is actually a topic that I already discussed in another video, but in a more general way. This one instead analyzes from one side the historiographical um, uh, aspect, let's say, what was believed about Italian communes at some point in history and how their their development and their um, specificities, their uniqueness actually was uh, was explained, really. And from the other side, looking in fact as an answer to the consular class, uh, if if you want, as you know here for the for the record, and I think that you, if you have listened to Sparpunk at this point, you know the difference, but you may be a new a new follower. When we speak of the Milites, of course, we're talking about the uh, 
in fact, the knightly class, except the two terms are different in a way. Today we, we talk mostly about the period that goes from the 10th to the 12th century. The 10th being also, um, say unspecifically, but the 10th being a very interesting phase for the development of the communes that, that weren't like uh, popping out like mushrooms out of nothing, right? And this is what, in fact, historiography has pointed out. There is a very strong, consolidated uh, political and institutional urban tradition that leaves municipal and municipal pride and entity and, and more uh, in Italy f from Roman times through also the early Middle Ages because of, you know, public administration under the, the Ostrogoths, the Longobards, the Carolingians, and, and more. And that uh, came, in fact, to play a, a very important role, as we've seen during the Ottonian era, and the investor struggle that was largely based, in fact, on what uh, on the leverage that the papacy could make on uh, the Italic cities um, for the Germanic emperors, of effectively, to, to get in trouble in there. And that's also a, a topic that we have, um, let's say, that we have to focus better on because it's, this is not just skipping to the mid 12th century, the clashes again between the, the Germanic emperors and the Lombard League. This is broad, this is a broader problem. It has to do with the meaning that we have fairly well introduced, I guess, at this point about uh, of the Italic Kingdom, the old Longobard Kingdom within the Holy Roman Empire. The, the reasons why it was fundamentally central and the uh, the, the one which the, um, the the imperial crown was attached, and uh, the um, and and the the answer lays greatly in this urban communities and how they were developing and being able to interact with greater powers. And but there are some specificities about this 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 areas because as you know, nor an Italic nor a Germanic crown were ever able to control. Uh, the communes, right? Uh, Italy had its own kings and even emperors. Um, then the uh, the Germans reaffirm their primacy uh, in the peninsula from Ottonian times, but effectively a permanent occupation doesn't fundamentally last, right? They are part of the empire, their subjects namely. They will always remain, they will never deny imperial identity and actual obedience, uh, even during uh, the the times the, the the harshest clashes of the Lombard League, not even later, right? These are areas that remain Holy Roman Empire until until Napoleon, right? And proudly so. Um, but at the same time, they they prevent fundamentally a, even a, a a single lordship to take over the city, right? Not even the bishop that was the locally um, kind of evident and an ob more obvious power to, to take over never actually uh, succeeds that. I mean, the same Rome is a good example. The city had its own commune, in a way, was more choked because uh, by, by the, the papal monarchy, because this was a bit of a different thing from the other dioceses. But um, the, the same communes evolve fundamentally um, from this military class, that of, of, of landowners and their broader familia, as we can call it, um, to strip the bishop of factual power, actually acting on behalf of the same bishop, because that was since uh, Ottonian times, and de facto already before, right, the, the actual uh, official authority in the district, as, as it had been also in other areas, of post-Carolingian Europe, but specifically in ever more important on a on a city base because all the most important signories would be found on, on these cities at the end of the day, and not on some kind of broader uh, I don't know country like I don't know in France or Germany you have cities but they do not have the same importance that uh, uh, Italy the Italian ones have, and and it's mostly the, the landed. Um, aristocracy that even lives out of the city at some point that, that rules, right? Instead, in Italy, the military class, that is also a specific one, because in Italy it's, it's sensually based, right? There is a strong um, aristocratic ethos, indeed, uh, some of these families descended from 
you know, old nobility, also of fact Longobardic, but also French or German origin, notoriously. And there was a, a great, um, a great pride attached to this. At least, you know, some just claimed that, but it was important for them to do so. And indeed, there was an important continuity, especially with the Longobard past. Um, but um, the um, the this military class was very um, very inclusive as as fastly growing and powerful right and achieving of course in these centers well fundamentally in no other region historically in the middle ages was was possible is creating a real state right these are not towns these are city states right there is a, a, a different um Properly a different mindset, a completely different identity from many other, even, I don't know, think about Flanders, that after Italy surely had the most advanced urban culture, they're conceptually just something else. Those were kind of just bourgeois, kind of mercantile um, centers expanding and having, of course, their own their own government, their own administration, but still quite um, uh, permeated, uh, infiltrated by other elements where the, um, the, the local lords had always maintained kind of a uh, an important control up to the 12th to 13th century um, and do not evolve uh, in the form of, a, of an actual state provided with um, a clear international uh, power, right? You have this commune sometimes being able to levy by the 13th, 14th century armies of 30,000 men, single communes, we're talking mostly about Milan, Florence, the most important, the most powerful, but still, I mean, uh, that's the reason why great part of the European balance fundamentally rested in the Holy Roman Imperial Axis within these factual states, right? And so it, it's one of those macroscopic um, uh, medieval European history chapters that, um, in my opinion, have not even been properly studied, right? And properly attributed the, the extraordinary characters that this had, because um, mostly the same Italian historiography mostly studied uh, just the, the civil aspect of the story, the administrative, they didn't this, yeah, properly the statal aspect, but you know that I'm a military historian and that I also feel pretty much the the traditional mm, beliefs and continuity of the same, in, also in the high and in, in, in even in the late Middle Ages and beyond. And the role of the Italian city-states there has a very specific meaning, in my opinion, uh, that is somewhat has been kind of hijacked, right, interpretationally, by the more modern and secular uh, historiography. All right, we will not talk about this today, but just to to make you aware gradually to introduce you, uh, so that you don't have a kind of a brutal impact eventually when I will come up with these topics with the uh, with the reality of the story. Well, no, it, it's it's really um, uh, an actual point. Um, but um, we'll have to go step by step. So the milites were essentially overlapping with the consular government, right? Um, the Italian city-states, a bit like, like in Rome, they had this collegial um, office, the most important one, the consulate, that was made up literally of, of two consuls, like in ancient times, and that, of course, as a consulship, they, they owned the Imperium, by the way, and the Milites, as knights, definitely in the Middle Ages, were pretty aware of what the Imperium really was, right? They had to control, after all, on behalf of the same emperor, these cities, and being also at the same time the expression of, of their power, uh, and so on. So, for, for a phase of the, let's say, the Italian commune's history is, is scanned by various phases. The first one, from their foundation, mostly at least from when they are documented as an institution, not because the city was not really uh, there before, but because, you know, this, this, this polity took the form within the city and, and controlling its district as a commune, properly. Um, the, uh, is the consular one, right? And the consular one overlaps with the co uh, rule of the milites that we will see now were essentially clans uh, made up, in fact, of this mostly landowners, but that were heavily invested also in mercantile activities, 
and the military ones because they these were all one right what the the Miles, uh sacked looted in the neighboring uh, rival commune district uh, would reinvest in, in the city in specialized crops in international trade in in lots of things um, in the fortification of, of the city if you look still you know there are some beautiful examples still visible you know uh, remaining in almost to, to the middle ages uh, urbanistically or architectonically for example the so-called house towers that are scattered a bit all over central northern Italy um, to to witness what these extremely powerful clans in fact could could afford right these were this is what we we're saying before where you know a French or German nobleman would have his uh, his fortress the center in in a castle in, in the countryside the Italian one would build a castle literally within the city right except uh, there would be lots of other clans that would build other castles within the same city, right? So, um, for whoever knows, you know, medieval archaeology, but the cities knows that uh, it was something incredible. Today, we don't see practically much of those, any of those towers anymore, um, because they were torn down and they, they were not truly built to last uh, in the millennia. But at the time, like, you would have been, you would have seen a city within the gates, like, with this massive thick and impenetrable you were probably not been able to see much you know beyond that because the, the skyline was all uh essentially crossed by towers and pretty damn high ones we're talking about several tens of meters high but pretty high so these still in fact exist but they were everywhere right and the reason is that they essentially bombarded each other and those who crossed the streets they were all narrow and kind of militarized they were all these militants naturally had their clans. There was also some broader kind of popular force, um, and the distinction between the so-called militia and the popola were uh, would, would be felt mostly starting from the from the second half of the 12th century, where the the, the lower classes began to they were actually the middle ones at that point to be to be felt against uh, a military class that was instead uh, locking literally because it could not include uh, everyone and was feeling herself threatened, by the way, in the process by the rise of the expansion of cities that were uh, by far, let's say, exceeding in, uh, in East, the, uh, the old Roman ring. In fact, there was often a, a second, a third even, for the suburbs that were expanding ar around out of the old ring and uh, that needed to be protected because all the workers that came to to, to in fact to serve the the oligarchs um, the fat people the the magnates so called uh, within the city relied on 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 their labor and so on um, bring to the eventually the overthrow of the militas uh, not quite in the strictly military sense meaning that uh, the popular evolves as the actual state that we talk about later and it has its own militas that are knights just like all the others many militas actually join the same popular at a point but the first phase is this it's, it's much more it's much simpler right it's much more typical also for the in, in theory for, for the rest of Europe right the feudal class essentially except these are not often feudal Militas, but some that even from you know ruling the city are able to impose their power over the actual f um, imperial fifth holders of the district, um, which horrified uh, uh, you know leaders like Frederick Barbarossa, for example, when he came to Lombardy. But um, meaningfully to to express what the, the novelty of what the, the, these realities really were were in essentially incomplete charge and they embodied also the actual elite right the, the section as you'll see now was literally one tenth of the population so clans made up not just by knights but also by notaries by merchants by by people who owned also a broader business and shops and crafts and so on um, and that however were part of the broader clan uh, it's a very again pretty brutal and this individuals naturally had um, they as you know the medieval knights had their own refinement after all but the, the the lifestyle of these men was literally military and therefore quite brutal and that's also why 
uh, later on the uh, the popolo decides that it's also that the feuds between the, the mm, um, w within the militias are also partially compromising a, a public uh, development and so on so that's what they arm themselves and we were talking about this incidentally I think last month um, about the Florentine vendetta that uh, illustrates how in the later period like this when uh, the, the, the magnates the, the, the old militia was was at the corner but um, at that point how important however the divisions within it were for the for for the broader city politics a crucial moment where you know the, the state within was being defined and such the control on on the main assets on the grain supplies literally who would control the city at that point anyhow we will see this further in other videos in any case um initially let's say in in, in historiography uh, up to some time ago not uh, not very far but let's say um the italian communes have always been hotly debated uh, in a sense and in this general also as essentially as the the cradle of, of humanism the renaissance later on they assumed in, in western historiography kind of different meanings right uh, from one side they were identified like the, the starters of modernity of secular thought so from one side was all this kind of satellistic modernistic projections on them then when communist historiography came came in they began to say no these were the, you know the, the, the strength of the people of the, of the workers and all this bullshit so they you know they were essentially misportrayed misrepresented ideologically for whichever agenda these uh, mostly politically based ideas were but um some decades ago um an inquiry was led on the um, on the base of prosopographical studies of the consular age you know that prosopography is essentially the studying of um, the individual's relations with others and so uh, it's not easy of course to track I don't know who, who really you know what was the establishment let's say in, in a complete fashion by centuries like the 11th to the 12th um, but you can you, you see these names in the in the charters in in the chronicles and so on and so you just you can start making connections between uh these various people which br groups they belong to, to which uh classes to which um political inclination which side they they took i don't know during the investiture struggle or the ones between the, the guelphs and the ghibellines and so on and so you're able to define more or less what their background was and so to, to with whom they were affiliated and and this um this helps you understanding the mechanics right of politics mostly within the same commune so um naturally the the easiest like the the cornerstone of this research has to do with the evidence provided uh, about those people who covered the office of consul because that's if, if anything that the most uh, say the the easiest the, the clearest to to document right and these this research has revealed also without too much effort in that sense sometimes you just have to to pose yourself the problem in history and you would be surprised by how you know many problems are not really posed you know about such uh, kind of broadly notorious um, topics uh, has revealed that the group of families that provided uh, the consuls in every Italian commune extended much more beyond the so-called capitanial group that is to say the one of properly the the that were conferred the, the command of the communal army to which belonged those that were directly or indirectly connected uh, uh, through feudal relations to the bishop or the other lords which is relevant because aside the the obvious fact that the most important uh, communal leaders were connected to like especially in the high middle ages so when still 
there was an important imperial mm, presence and uh, especially through one of actual imperial fief holders were the same bishops the same the local Italic um, traditional we could say aristocracy there were lots of other people that were siding uh, with, with, with these with these leaders right and this research has also demonstrated that excepting very rare exceptions all the consuls that we know had a an economical possibility due to different activities mostly land management trade uh, war uh, spoils and the same military service per se in order to sustain the maintenance of one or more war horses and the technical competence for fighting with them right in other words they all came from those that participated to the communal army in quality of militas that is the knights right so this concept is crucial because it basically means that in Italy in communal Italy the uh, ruling class of the single cities without any exception fundamentally came from uh, a military uh, background that was not sanctioned as such by the uh, the official feudal hierarchy right these were men who had the power the skill the simply the habit the custom the lifestyle to fight as knights that are that were in this region so many and so powerful that could essentially and would essentially take over the city government from the traditional imperial feudal hierarchy right to which they they were still connected in some way again because these were the same people it's not that the feudal hierarchy came from somewhere else again the, there was a phase of course when there were you know also foreign appointments etc you find again a, a, an important germanic presence even in in the, the onomastics in the general as we were saying before also identity feeling of this this idea of, of the imperium that was felt uh, i also made a video recently about how the romans had chosen to be german literally at some point right so their identity was this, this were italians fundamentally but they still cared particularly much about this older idea of the um of also kind of a national identity that conferred them a uh, sort of uh, superior force compared to the the rest of, of 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 the commoners and definitely this reflects the typical knightly uh, militas mentality that existed elsewhere right it was a ferocious divide between the knights and, and the rest of, of of the people in general but the reason of course why Italy also has this specific political institutional development with the communes, etc., that f actually are the cover the entirety of the kingdom, right? As we're talking about Lombardy, Tuscany, generally speaking, the entire northern Italy, aside from certain areas that remain kind of more feudal. Uh, but this is true also uh, across the Apennine. But the most powerful areas, Lombardy, Tuscany, they are the ha the, the the cradle of these communal. Uh, civilization that also develops mostly if you look at the political geography of it from the lands that had belonged to the former uh, that had been the centers properly of the Longobard kingdom where properly the Lombard Longobard kings had established a, a strong public administration starting unavoidably from the cities right so Lombard in Tuscany uh, what could have been different could have help, happened somewhere else but this is just for saying that it, it this thing had been engineered throughout the Middle Ages because, you know, in late antiquity, I don't know, nor the Sizzlepine Gold, the Po Valley wasn't really like a particularly developed nor connected area, even with ones like Tuscany or Provence, etc. Instead, this thing by the High Middle Ages has fundamentally taken all another shape. And um, the 
common the the people in Italy were traditionally free, right? Uh, th this was a prerogative of the Italic Kingdom, um, and there was which was due also to a to a broader well this this broader custom how the the history of the country had uh, fundamentally developed, but also because uninterruptedly uh, Italy had maintained the highest per capita wealth in the world uh, from Roman times and it would maintain it fundamentally up to the end of the 17th century so um, this was a very different reality where the same militas paradoxically in this sense were more like could emerge uh, more uh, more spontaneously than through a kind of feudal mediation like it could happen in France or, or in Germany, right? So this aspect is really crucial because it reflects also the fact the, the, the complete innovation that the, the militia in Italy had compared to uh, the Transalpine regions. That is to say, it was a sensual one. Whoever was uh, morally and materially fit that is, uh, to, to fight as a knight on a war horse that costed an astonishing amount. It, it was just like owning a private jet, right, for those time standards. But if you have that, you, you are, you must, you have actually the, the duty, yes, but first and foremost, you have the privilege, the absolute privilege of bearing arms and to participate to the exercitus of the city, which essentially embodied that imperial Romano-Germanic idea for which eventually later also the, the Lombard League would fight in opposite, you know, for, for their own rights, for their own um, autonomies against the same emperor, right? That would make them so confident to, to take arms against literally the imperial army and even managing to, to win um, on the field against and seeing their their rights and autonomies sanctioned right um, by the same emperor at the, famously enough at the Council of Constance so the strictly military identity of the city naturally the exercitus was not uh, participated just by the militas but this as we were saying before the uh, Italian communal infantries that were made up mostly by commoners. Uh, this time, also in the origins, not you know, also the the knights could dismount, as we've seen recently in some other videos, also about other regions, etc. But the concept here, here is that the communal citizens were freemen, right? And participating to the exercitus, also given the abundant amount of infantry that was really considerable, not just in quantity but in quality. Uh, both morally and materially in, in the Italian armies at the time, embodied that same principle. These were as the commune, um, in fact, communities of freemen that were jealously um, proud of the status because in the, in, in the Romano-Germanic tradition that was in force uh, like uh, at the time, even you know it was mostly a, a, a Germanic law, uh, or various Germanic laws blended with the feudal one. But Roman law was being re revived, etc. It was essentially a borough custom. The freeman is not a freeman, as we have been told, like in this kind of republican democratic, um, in fact, manipulation of history by saying, ah, you know, there was a kind of an idea of equality of you know. Uh, standard rights that are owed by something. No, no, these people believed that they were noble, that they owned the imperium, bearing arms, even as a humble commoner in, say, a, a Lombard um, army, meant that you were a nobleman, a literal nobleman, because freedom is associated exclusively with nobility. Actually, it, it's what defines it in the first place. Right, and and that's why there couldn't be like somebody was by class superior to someone else. This is very different from a, a completely different mentality from anything that existed in Europe at the time. There was a there were communal movements elsewhere in southern France. Uh, there are communes in 
you know, generally speaking, also, in, as you know, in, in, in the rest uh, of France, in Germany, um, Spain also has an important urban tradition. But again, these Italian communes developed the city-states fully aware that there is no interference from other feudal elements, or at least even if there is, it's, re it's irrelevant to the point that these communes will take over the same feudal prerogatives and quite uh, quite quickly and quite uh, you know without much of a problem from their side by the way and that's deemed to have the ab absolute privilege of freedom right and uh, this is um, which was to be sanctioned by the emperor etc right this again for somebody living north of the Alps was uh, unconceivable north of the Alps people were not free Right, you were under somebody else. You were somebody else's person. Right, in Germany, the commoners didn't have any of this. They were disposed of. They were very often unfree. The same, the same um, German knights largely were rising in an important um, quota to from from the servile background, the famed ministeriales. Right, not that they were anything less from a military point of view, but juridically they were bound to their masters in a completely different way because they didn't have the autonomy uh, or even less the freedom um, to to afford even to be something else, right? Th that those were wars ruled by single lords that fundamentally had eroded and uh, cancelled the actual uh, people's freedom and that just had firmly maintain them under control that that's why uh, this attitude was un unconceivable right literally frederick barbarossa when he came to woman was shocked by this he 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 thought this was a monstrosity uh, because the these commoners were, were commoners and they had the deep the actual power to to control the the imperial uh thief holders and to to impose them literally conditions and to govern them and to exact from them this was the normality actually in the uh, everything was being done let's say there was there was some fiction considering of course the and, and juridical innovation to put in in various terms regarding for example who had to rule over the the public districts that the, co that the city also uh, were at the head of so the commune had substituted essentially to, to episcopal power by acting formally on behalf of it but the fact that this was the normal way um, medieval communities uh, developed normally, like there was a, a local custom that was God-given, where it was a natural uh, right fundamentally that the rulers had to protect. And the fact that this was the arguably the only area of Europe, um, and at the time, uh, considering the level of development in general, the most civilized area, possibly the only one in the world where instead the people had enough power to challenge universal authority by an actual institutional uh, and, and legal culture and more, right? Also a military one and, and beyond. So um, this scene, again, is perhaps the single most important and in fact very much overlooked aspect of Italian communes. What you have made believe about them it's ah uh, you know these are just cities like you know they they traded and so they were rich and so they were powerful no this was it's, it's not a mechanistic um thing it's not a socio-economical construct it's an absolute political and military self-confidence surely supported also by uh, material wealth and so on but it's it's something beyond it's something that is um aware of itself in the the imperial gain and that pretends those god-given rights to be respected by the same emperor even when they had basically taken them over where the, the management of the local public prerogatives had been essentially seized by those that in the absence of the germanic emperors that had uh, troubles on their own and that for a long time also would, would not descend to to the Italian peninsula and de facto could not ad administrate justice and so and to, to control the air so carrying out those functions that they were elected to um, and that in fact were you know seen in that sense as the true proof 
of their own empire. There was much more uh, than this, that the struggles eventually between the Germanic emperors and the Lombard League was naturally exacerbated also by the, the struggle between papacy and, and empire. Um, the Swabians were, after all, recompact in Germany after generations of, of civil strife that had been triggered by essentially the, the, the defeat of the imperial universal prerogatives through the Concordat of Worms that had de facto, in fact, uh, severed uh, the, the Italian uh, episcopate uh, from the, uh, the, the imperial direct appointment. So it had changed a big deal. It was even some kind of proto-national hatred. Um, and it's an important thing because even when you have to parliament, really, and what happened in this uh, diets in, in, in Lombardy, etc., with, with the emperor, well, just the fact that you speak a different language, that you don't understand yourself between Germans and Italians, doesn't help, right? doesn't matter... Like it's it's a um, of course um, say uh, they would understand each other in Latin, but uh, they all had their own view on the thing, right? Translating certain German or Italian terms in Latin, for example, in the drafting of the official accounts of those diets was was a challenge because it, as it happened, as we've seen it also recently in some other medieval occurrences, like you know the Ecumenic Councils, etc. Every side would kind of at the end of the day interpret certain things or in, uh, as they wanted and uh, linguistic difference could could help in that regard. The paradox was of course that the Germanic emperors would want to centralize their empire from Italy uh, rather than from Germany it would even fuel uh, dramatically part of the same of that same public culture through Famously enough, the revival of Roman law that favored dramatically a Caesar papistic view um, of, the, in fact, of of the empire to Roman law, just like in Constantinople, so to to affirm the Germanic emperor's prerogatives on uh, on the papacy, etc. So that's the kind of background that you have to look at. But when you realize that the consular class, that is the one that essentially fights, uh, also the the wars of, against the Swabians um, is one of of free and let's say not just free born but um, politically free knights that are also communal citizens in this regard right and, and they have a huge prerogative because they are powerful enough to display their imperium through their military fitness well that's actually a uh, a big game changer, also properly in the identity, in the, in the the moral sense of these people, in the mindset of these people. Um, and here we could, at some point, we'll make videos about the uh, even just what was the military potential of of this region altogether. Because we, if we count the single cities, sometimes again, as we were saying before, we see that they could field armies that had the same size of of a royal one. And if if you count that, you know, there were like thirty city states. That doesn't equate to you know 30 kingdoms, but uh, still, the the broader potential that in every medieval country actually was much higher on paper than in practice. But there, when actually displayed on the field, and you can even measure it in part, you realize, as Contamine, for example, those uh, other other authors have pointed out, these were kind of the most uh, not just powerful but also bellicose and kind of warlike. Uh, if not the most warlike, uh, at least the most military active uh, region in Europe in many ways. And again, if you realize that the consular class uh, the co of the communal government, in fact, the establishment of the communal government was made up by militas, you understand a lot of that. Well, of course, the, the same is true for the other, like all the other establishment in Europe was made by militas. But these guys are politically and institutionally organized in a completely different way. And more, just culturally, they're something else. Um, so this datum um, should not mm, surprise anyone considering the deep military roots of the Italian urban communities that had rendered less easy than elsewhere in, in the high medieval centuries the stabilization of seigneuries over a city.
right? Um, so this aspect, again, given that there was in theory an Italic crown uh, within a, a, a Holy Roman Empire, so with with, a, with actually a universal crown attached to the latter, and the fact that in fact nobody ha could have could really control the cities since the 10th century, which is exactly again the, where the, some not the commune but you know the premises for the commune start you know uh, even though again the roots are much older but in, in factual mm, possibility of government and the city start developing is also quite revealing right uh, I made several videos about the Ottonians and also Ottonian Italy and the issue of the bishops counts right and we have explained how after less than a century actually of vacancy of, of an actual um, royal and, and imperial power the uh, the Germans couldn't quite um, control the peninsula and resume their kind of uh, broader universal policy also against the Byzantines against the Saracens things there you know the Ottonians were the only ones that the, the only Holy Roman emperors to effectively extend, like in relative terms, their their power also in Italy to, to the to the extent to to the highest extent, um, they um, the actual control of the cities was quite um, negotiated, was quite as always compromised by the uh, first of all the recognition of the just of the um, the local establishment in that side right the the bishops counts had been established by the Ottonians not by literally much creating much other sources of power but uh, recognizing the the same ones that existed within the cities themselves and even when they could actually appoint a bishop the city was already not in full control the the, the lay nobility and starting from Rome from which Otto III also had to, to go away after having written a very angry letter to the same Romans by saying, you know, what the hell? Like, I mean, the Roman emperor, and and you do not, you know, you do not, you're not under my control. That was a, a huge issue internationally, right? Especially for a guy who was half Byzantine and that was trying to resume that kind of universal unity. He realized that these cities were not to be governed. Um, the the lay nobility often, also, and that's where partly. Um, the things intertwine also with the in fact that the papal uh, the investor struggles later on is that the the empire still kind of um, relied on a, a faction within the city gates that still was that local faction as opposed to the other one was more kind of popularly supported but at the end of the day controlling the cities was essentially receiving support from one of the two right hoping that your presence would maintain but it was not thing like like a real occupation by the way the, the german lay nobility was not interested at all in the italian expeditions by the way because they costed a lot um they were in fact not like a permanent uh occupation it was something always kind of um you know unstable and uh, uncertain about that and so it's mostly also the german bishopric that supported the empire at some point because it was kind of more wanted to be protected from the abuses of the lay uh, of the lay aristocracy in part but as you know uh, the the imperial presence in Italy albeit it was felt militarily there were many raids those stations whatever for centuries it was just intermittent right it was mostly connected to the same problem of the imperial crowning that had to happen in, by the hands of the Pope uh, in Rome uh, and that thus entailed having to make an, an entire army crossing the Alps and reaching Rome and coming back which required necessarily the control of the cities along the way at least and that was the again always the greatest challenge in the world in the world process right doesn't matter how you know uh, you know, successful eventually the expedition could be regarding the, the crowning the same Rome was threatened militarily 
by the emperors, etc. But at some point you have to come back to Germany, first of all, where you, your power base lays, and you uh, you can't quite, uh, you know, uh, spend too much time in an area that requires a much greater effort to be subdued, and that not even the, the massive, but I mean the massive one of Frederick Barbarossa that was at, at the peak uh, in, in the, uh, of, of, of uh, Holy Roman Imperial power historically as a force, um, were enough. Right to, and we're talking about things like raising Milan to the ground, the Milanese rebuilding it from scratch in a few years, L literal history. Right, so that tells you how it, there was a lot of, you know, there is also a lot of German literature about this, the the, the satire against um, the same emperor, this idea of the lion that arrives and wants to crush all the various ants' nest, the, the Italians, you know, he tries to 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 fill one. Uh, hole in the ground and another, but the ants come from from all ways, and there is no way that this lion breaks apart, as the empire they thought was breaking apart. Um, and this natural this naturally doesn't mean, however, that uh, it was a, a bad idea per se, right? But it had that the reason why it didn't work in the end it still was largely the opposition of the communes for how they had being habituated just to defend their own prerogatives, arms in hands. Um, and, um, and of course, the birth of the Italian communes within the uh, development of European local powers is to be connected with the multiplication of the milites exactly during these most intense struggles, during the 10th and the 11th centuries, that were exactly the ones in which the uh, Deltonians had tried to, uh, and eventually the Franconians had tried to enforce their own control, uh, specifically starting from the cities, right, and also separating in that sense the episcopal side, the pars episcopi, in Latin, that was seen as the 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 head of the of the city, according to the feudal hierarchy, because again in Ottonian times the Italian bishops were provided with the comital authority, right, uh, in, on the city on the district, and the rest, uh, or at least those who within the same parcel. Episcopy at some point, as Militas, as also the, the, the pretty, you know, the remarkable Episcopal retinues that existed in Italy, etc., would began to, to realize that they had actually a, a, a greater weight and that they could challenge the same empire and, um, and the same control over the comitatus as such. Right, this div division is, is quite relevant also. It, it does start from the lay aristocracy, the last uh, Italic kings that also fought against the, the last uh, Ottonians were essentially resuming this kind of um, uh, idea that after all they, they had a, uh, they, they were the, the lay arm right, of the force. And they were coming, in fact, not surprisingly, from areas that, at the time, were still um, reminiscent of that kind of more typically transalpine rural feudal authority that, in fact, existed in kind of some marches, um, uh, etc., especially in Piedmont, North uh, Eastern Italy, and so on, that were kind of less urbanized, but still, uh, in fact, had um, an important feudal power that could could hope at least to to challenge to rise against the, the imperial authority also to secure the italic crown and thus the imperial authority as well but fundamentally the militas see that um urbanizing that is properly going to live in in the city of course maintaining their these were all landowners right all around the city though um was more convenient than resuming the idea of, of the italic of an independent italic kingdom and that kind of feudal powers fundamentally dissolve. I mean, they exist, but as we've seen, just the communes 
come to, to take them over. And again, they are the same militants and they're the same that the same also in theory feudal culture that had survived through the concept of what the militants had to be within within a Holy Roman Empire. Right? So that's even more striking because it tells you how uh, successful the communal enterprise was to actually prefer it even to the to the previous established order right after all it was much more convenient for a knight to live in a city than to live in in the countryside he could control much more resources and through their through their force right the, the militants are decisive here there are no let's say um, fundamentally the cavalry has the upper hand on the infantry uh, like in in all um, in all Europe at that point and interestingly enough while other areas of Europe also characterized by an important urban development like Flanders will at some point actually have an infantry capable of beating cavalry albeit coming back as we we're just talking about yesterday to relative um, nothingness in the with the crisis in the, in the mid 14th century so just shortly after in Italy that during the 12th 13th centuries had the, the strongest infantry in Europe cavalry always remained in charge in control and the most powerful arm which is also in fact a testament of how how deeply integrated the militias had been in the Italian states and not something like um, you know like in in Flanders where the the, the, the militia of bourgeois were just infantry had rebelled to the feudal cavalry of the, of the French feudal system. In Italy there's none of that because the knights, the, uh, the people live all together because they are a state, they are politically co cohesive and it would have been silly just to, to separate each other, um, especially in, uh, in the face of a you know, a severe onslaught like the one at the time of the Lombard League. It was a time which, in the greatest moment of clash between the militias and, and, and the people, um, the knights and the infantry would fight separately, things like these, but they were still part of the same army, right? And they never, there was, there was nothing like, you know, the infantry men kind of wanting to kick out the militias because, again, they belonged all to a world that was deeply connected with the interests of of the militias that were the same people, especially in Italy, of uh, literally the people, right? Those who could be rich enough to afford a war horse and fight, so that the people had also the popolo had its own militias as well. May sound confusing, but it's not. Again, I I made a um, it's all really much simpler than it sounds. I made um, again lots of uh, videos about the popolo, the militias, and and this dynamics because um, they're a bit the ABC of of, of this uh, this times and places, and without that you can't quite get to to the core of of the problem. But that also, from a military point of view, is quite interesting because if you don't understand the difference, as it's been not been done historiographically, you can also generate some confusion regarding the the actual strength of the various arms. Right. If you base them, for example, just on the concept that, you know, here infantry defeats cavalry, sometimes it can just be a matter of social segmentation having a very strong impact on that, and not say the the actual technical development or even the broader um, military culture advancement. So these are the new frontiers of actual uh, medieval warfare research, and not. Um, some other kind of strange um, mechanistic idea, which were instead promoted. In fact, uh, as w as was hinted at before, it was a long debate regarding the birth of the Italian communes. Right during the 20th century, and good good part of it, right, uh, there were essentially two sides. Right, it was kind of uh, uh, more a right wing side and a left wing side. Right and or kind of more idealistic, more materialistic side, if, if you prefer. Um, one side um, believed, say the the right one, uh, that the um, at the base of of the commune as a new urban institution, there was um, essentially a class that had had prospered in the in the in the bishops shed let's say 
um, so counts and marquises and so on and in a class that founded its own status on the detention the, the possession of uh, in fact landed rural seigneuries uh, so a nobility that would not be too different from the rest of Europe right the the, the left side instead said that the birth of the commune was tied to the needs of new men the whose distinctive characteristic would have been the exercise of a more dynamic and modern economical activity such as commerce uh, money lending and all these things um, and the point is that these two ideas um, these two sides these two perspectives are actually both part of the same reality right this two aspects of the militas overlap right and 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 this is being demonstrated at this point that the city militas founded and extended uh, for the first century of its existence uh, the Italian communes right and it allows to essentially explain all these specificities of the Italian situation in long term right so they were doing both things they were both men of war men of trade uh, they lived in in the city as much as they owned uh, landed the, the loan landed la assets in in the countryside um, what is crucial here is the uh, as, as a base of the commune is the uh, an objectively new institutional project Right, that is not simply aimed at the preservation of privileges uh, of uh, of definitely what was yes an hegemonic social uh, class but also a quite economically dynamic one um, uh, socially heterogeneous and open both towards the above and the below uh, so the more militas you 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 make come in 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 the, in the business, and the more powerful this thing is gonna become. And given the dramatic um, economic and demographic growth of, of the region, um, surely it was possible to heal the system and to expand further and to consolidate further and to create really a a politically cohesive and cohesive reality already on the base of a progress municipal identity sense of status in fact military lifestyle and so on it was easy it was a broader point it was commanding these areas it was ruling over them and the immense riches of, of the markets uh, of the of the land around on on given the the, the, the booming of, of the trade uh, routes the uh, the enormous business that the maritime centers were making uh, with, with the East during the Crusades and beyond right so when we look at the the commune and you want to identify the military class you realize that this counted more than 10 percent of the city population which is more or less the same segmentation that you find in fact in the army like for I don't know 10 uh, in, in 10 fighters one was a knight let's say and the others were something else that were either part of the, of the retinue lighter cavalry mostly infantry right so it's also actually similar to other areas of Europe um, but this is at the top shared uh, and shared with uh, for with an enormity of wealth um, that uh, allows for for a long time this still uh, th this is not a state yet right socialization would arrive mostly and gradually to throughout the 13th century especially would consolidate from the the, the second half of the same but it, it was consolidating on the basis that had been laid by the the consular government right that would 
need also to control the expansion through an administration, uh, through accounting, through through law, right? These are again uh, the, the uh, this is the era in Europe uh, on the fore in juridical development. I've made lots of videos, medieval law about this. Um, so to manifest the need of a justice capable of granting uh, patrimonies and and rights, and to encourage the commercial expansion and to possess the the economical and military capacities to sustain the conquest um, and the control of the territory, right? Uh, you needed a military backbone that included uh, from the within the um, captains, the um, the sub vassals, etc. So all people that had also belonged to the feudal establishment, um, the, the the imperial hierarchy, uh, and that they all came to join instead this other alternative political reality that was essentially developing at the side of the uh, old institution, just as a free commune. Right, like any other community, but provided again with, with a massive power that could even take over the those prerogatives. Because again, they were the same people that had made the public, uh, the public office, the imperial uh, administration work, right? And that now were eff effectively running the same, the same country in this way, um, and the. The, the the detail about this that can make you understand how let's say self um, referential this institution was is that being part of the militia uh, didn't require to be dubbed that is on the ritual conferment from the side of a lord of the cingulum militaris um, and that thus could uh, incorporate within the the milites emerging families of the of the city of the district and also people that were coming there from a relatively short time before like if they were if they were powerful enough they were welcome so the milites here you understand why the dubbing was skipped the, the dubbing still existed as such Right, uh, the most powerful militas were dubbed. Um, they were displaying through that uh, an enormous power. They would, especially during the 12th century, kind of you know increase the uh, the, the the gap, let's say, be, be between the the higher, the most powerful militas and the and the others in a more hierarchical and kind of crystallized way. But at the beginning, there was no need of founding the 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 milas status on that on some kind of either a, a higher um, force etc because at the same time in, in the very indo-european tradition those who bore arms were de facto and living free were de facto already sacred as we were saying before they were already free they were already noble right and that's why they were also so driven to belong to this group. It was not just the evident enormous interests and benefits that it could, could get from the new model in the moment of decentralization of Italy from imperial control, etc. But um, it was the sublimation of an older traditional universal ideal that they were kind of re um, assuming in, um, in also in an oppositional sense against what they perceived as an ineffective empire that should have been a universal one and that was neither actually crossing the Alps anymore to reaffirm uh, the same power and also barely controlling Germany on many occasions given the, the frequent strifes etc the, the clashes with the papacy the excommunications and so on so it was actually a, um, a an incredibly important um, international reaffirmation of, of an older order, 
as it was perceived uh, as a military religious one. And considered that, I, I made videos about this, about the military lifestyle, this, they were very often connected, were kind of in this clan some companies, some, um, in fact, of, 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 of knights that uh, were kind of sworn devotees to some kind of higher, um, some kind of higher sp spiritual uh, military mission, right? There were also reminiscence of the ancient comitatus. There were some, the, the, Vo the Knights of the Wolf. This was sworn um, brotherhoods that so in, in their own um, military lifestyle, the, the confirmation of their moral superiority, the, the Knights of King Arthur, there were lots of these things considered that Italy at this time was being permeated also dramatically by by French literature and so uh, through that the, the, the Britonic cycle, the Arthurian legions, um, the same, also the same Germanic ones by a certain extent. It was a moment of great revival of the same prestige of that class. It was triumphant. Right, um, and it was the same militia from which the majority of the judges and the experts of law came from, or that, thanks to the importance that such professionals assumed within the new communal institution, that um, and that they were eager to 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 welcome in, in their own ranks to provide the juridical capacities to satisfy the demand for the regulation of conflicts that came from the entire community of the city and of the district. In other words, it's as if the lack of imperial control had brought the uh, Italic population to demand to these individuals to to create another order, another establishment, right? And the commune was able to provide with that, right? Through this um, pre pretty transversal exercise, right? There was a political office, the, the magistracies, the consulate, the communal statutes, the councils, the assemblies, uh, the law, the the lawyers, those who work to research law and what and from from different sources and stimulating the the greatest juridical uh, revival in medieval history and regulating the immigration from the countryside and uh, expanding the the city walls. So all uh, accompanied by a by by a, a massive uh, urbanistic architectonic um, engineering. Uh, effort uh, the properly the transformation of the countryside uh, creating channels specialized crops um, controlling the territory once the commune fundamentally occupied it negotiating with the various um, rural com communes that also existed the uh, the same feudal aristocracy that was joining the commune I made a video about the the communal tax, too, in the case of Vercelli, by the way, um, and what that entailed, that is putting in common a certain amount of wealth for the public needs, for the army, mostly. Um, all this done with, with a, as we've seen, a, an incredible economical expansion and so new practice of, of, of accounting, um, uh, properly of, a, of, of administration, uh, more essentially a, a greater centralized uh, system and all this again cumulating from these cities that all together are like 30 right and they are doing practically all the same thing because there's no such thing like yes of course the communes and the consuls are born we know one city in a specific year one in another but they're all basically in the same period right and even if you don't find that evidence of it's not formalized in that time they are all doing the same thing at the same time, and the following um, is political institutional development later on with the potestas, with also the, the clashes with the people, all happens in these 30 city-states between central and northern Italy, all in the same freaking time, 
right? This wasn't happening, by the way, just in the Italic Kingdom per se. It was happening also in the Papal States because, of course, uh, the level of urbanization was comparable. The, the development was the same. Um, it's um, it's part of a broader um, political geography. It would eventually characterize also Italy uh, in, during the Ancien Regime, um, during still the existence of the Holy Roman Empire, but that still today produces that kind of core that you find in the uh, in the higher per capita wealth uh, in the in the GDP of central northern Italy. I don't know that like per capita wealth in absolute terms is higher, I don't know, than the one of Germany and the one of Sweden. Uh, the GDP is higher than the French and German average. Still, again, this thing in ancient times was the other way around. The most developed areas were central and southern Italy. In the Middle Ages, you have the shift for towards central and northern Italy that also come to be accommodated by this experience, of, of which, in fact, the communing part of this, meaning not quite literally, because, of course, the various communes hated each other's guts, and, in fact, you know, the same kind of uh, municipalistic um, attitudes are still pretty much alive today among the Italians. And th this is to say that you know, don't think that the history of people changes like in a few generations. Look at, at the various countries' histories and, and see what the word like 1,000 years ago, 2,000 years ago, and see what, essentially, how much of that is still informing their culture, their mindset, their vision. Um, that's a completely different topic, but it is what, what I'm trying to insist in every video I make, that the delusion that you are a person extrapolated from nothing and that you can be just you're not let's say you're not to be judged or, or you know identified or such by your background is complete and utter bullshit and only the people who are insecure and that know that their background is fundamentally not maybe particularly developed or whatever um, feel the hysterical gnostic heretical need to pretend that history doesn't matter, that history is just, you know, some strange thing that, you know, if it happened, I don't know, 1,000 years ago, it doesn't matter. It matters entirely. Because the literal way different peoples think is pretty much deriving from this, right? And, it, and there is a massive continuity throughout the centuries, if not the millennia. Very specific thoughts that um, characterize cultures, civilizations, and very often the lack thereof, right, in those areas that you can't, uh, you, you, you cannot explain why communism spread among the underdevil, right, uh, otherwise. It, it, it's something uh, just evident in, in the history of countries. The mastering of a religious military capacity by a people is a mark that uh, is not to be purchased, right, discounted by somebody in the third millennium, right? It's something completely different. Right. And also studying, in fact, Holy Roman Imperial history in this sense is quite instructive. Because you wouldn't understand how, for example, countries like Germany and Italy that were not unified until basically the same, uh, almost the same decade in the 60s to the 70s of, of, of the 19th century, could actually and can be that the countries they are today, if they hadn't had still this background. So that, that means that there is something that goes beyond and that is a powerful force that also is not necessarily um, connected to the uh, to the lack of a of a political unity, right? Because that is that actually brought deficits in. If you wonder why you know there was a fascist Italy or a Nazi Germany, it's also because of that. Telling the truth, but it's also the bad side. And I always tell you, even from a conservative perspective, to appreciate like big countries like Britain, like France, etc., and what they represented in also in contemporary history and so on, because they they did in that case too have a, a, a fundamentally a millennial history of unitary uh, or almost at least of uh, of a unitary political identity, right? And that also is quite relevant, but it also they also paid in other terms. So, in any case, 
they definitely embodied the, the best of that kind of Western control, the same imperial ideal of the French and the English is, is remarkable. But this thing is, again, nurtured, but in different ways, still to, to important levels that, again, for every country must be somewhat evaluated. You can't just, and, and that's the, the splendor of Europe in many ways. There's also the splendor of, of countries deriving from Europe in similar ways. If you talk about the United States, you can't claim that because they, you know, 300 years ago, they didn't exist, right? They existed, right? And before that, even if they're not in America, they existed and they existed in Europe. Um, so there is something, again, about, about culture in the past that must necessarily be resumed as one of the single most powerful indicators and also predictors of specific cultural and civilizational development. In any case, that's another... That's another thing. Um, you realize how impacting this dynamic really was, because again, if you look at communal Italy, as you know, um, the same signories and the regional states would effectively, like again, in the crystallization of the 14th, 15th century of the ancien regime in Europe, is more or less what you get in that case, the case of Italy, at least, uh, like uh, Germany uh, in, uh, in other ways also up to the 19th century so it it's something that was formed was molded in this centuries eventually to stay that right for a long time so it's not just an accident of fate something that appeared an ephemeral experience no it was a massively systemic and in deep profound um movement and of course um, again also had deep roots uh, as we were saying before that very often overlooked right I made very few videos about the in fact the Roman origins of the uh, of the Italian communes in many ways at least the continuity that existed with the with the older municipia um, specifically in Italy and the broader tra municipal tradition in fact that remained alive differently from other areas in Europe, some other areas in Europe, but definitely in the most intense way there throughout all the early Middle Ages, the High Middle Ages, which is, which is something that you often not, like most videos I see um, around, I mean, in the general historical perception, like there, there are no videos like explaining the fact that, I don't know, there was, there was a massive continuity from ancient through, throughout medieval times, especially in Southern Europe for obvious reasons. Uh, no, it's like everything is doomed. Like after the, the Western Roman Empire finishes, let's look at what, you know, Rome looked like, you know, all depopulated with the forest. Within. How did it look like? You know, pick a book and study Roman archaeology. And why would you be interested specifically in that specific moment and not in the massive uh, urbanistic development of Rome during the same Middle Ages, which is of capital civilizational importance? And you would just look at that kind of empty, minimalistic, and by the way, not even correct, because Rome was quite, it was first of all the largest uh, still city in the West, um, but it had a lot of stuff and that was built specifically at that time. Why don't you check that rather than saying, oh, the, 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 this iconoclastic, cataclysmic, catastrophic view of, of things happening, it didn't really happen, right? Uh, of course, it was a profound trauma, especially with the Gothic War. But I mean, what I'm talking about here is the general perception. Why would you just look at that? You wouldn't look at what happened, you know, five seconds la later. That was already something to say, wow, that you can still see, for example, even in the same Rome today, and concentrate on that and concentrate on what the papacy was doing and what it achieved in early medieval times all over Western Europe. Like, so why don't you do that that is removed right and that is a, a, the product of a specifically secularistic modernistic and anti-military and religious history that has been enforced by uh, essentially cultural marxism and relativism and determinism stemming from this deprivation that our cultural identity has been um uh, suffering of 
of the single most important aspect of human uh, of humanity that is moral superiority we have been deprived of that right and and the way i, I talk history on Schwerpunkt is deliberately aimed at restoring that vision because you see it's not that someday I woke up and said oh well I, I will start you know uh, using this narrative when I make videos well I learned it because I learned history and until I, um, I, I did this for consistently systematically I had no idea because nobody had ever told me I learned this along the way I didn't invent this on the way I mean I invented it in the sense of invenio, of the Latin term it means to discover, actually. Um, but I didn't ma make it up, if, if that's what, what I mean. Or I don't enforce it because I think it's not right. I truly believe this was the case, because every single damn thing you read uh, from history tells me exclusively this about any culture. So I don't understand why... Um, this is not being discovered yet. This is not being like said out loud. Look, we've been. It, it's not even that we're being lied to. It's that there's not really just a, a, simply a conspiracy. There, there's been a, a moral decay that has brought us not to recognize meaning and values anymore. And this is valid for everyone, as you know. Even speaking from an actual conservative perspective, just because I fit the, this, the that spectrum according to kind of popular, uh, the, the vulgata, let's say, um, I still think that conservatism today doesn't even have a, a, a minimal glimpse of, of any of this, right? It's just garbage uh, because it totally ignores it. it. It just reasons through socialistic, essentially collectivistic ideology. It doesn't have any spiritual value, not even actual theists, uh, or, you know, actually self satisfied So, actually really get what, what religion historically was and why it was the way it was. And so, what even what they claim to believe and have faith in actually means, which they, they can't describe uh, the overwhelming amount of the time uh, on an actual moral and scientific base that actually does exist on an historical base. We know it. We have documented it. But anyhow, uh, I care about this probably more than anything else, than more even than this same topics per se, right? And um, I'd say to conclude a little bit about these Italian communes, but what is crucial to understand here again that the ruling class, the establishment of Italian communes, founded its primary identity on war like the the milit has prospered during the wars among the, within the same communes right this is the radically overwhelming aspect the italian communes civilizationally boomed by fighting against one another do you realize what what this means right and 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 this this boom went on for centuries right while they were fighting each other every single freaking time all the freaking time constantly against one another and they hated each other in a way that we can't even properly feel today anymore um, the same goes for the wars between uh, the empire and and the and the various leagues it's not even just the Lombard one, but anyways, there was a Veronese one uh, during the 12th. And widening, right, as the cities um, witnessing the rise also of new tensions within itself. This means that these, uh, these policies were powerful in the sense that they were expanding, were struggling within themselves. It's, it's, it's like the same concept of Israel. It's the, the same concept of the Indo-European of the doctrine of self-sacrifice you cannot achieve anything as a human being um, worth of, of anything essentially if you do not struggle right uh, not even against even external enemies but primarily within yourself you cannot achieve you cannot win you cannot transfigure right and there is even in there in humanism and in the renaissance that took over as you know Europe um, 
in so many ways and this origin in this military element probably the single most overlooked aspect of the scene the transfigurational capacity like the same beauty of the art of this if you look here at the pictures i've inserted we're talking about the 12th century here it's not uh the renaissance if you look at the delicacy at the perfection of the purity um of the artistry you realize it was something within these people that as you see here they associate everything to, to war to, to to the military to the symbols look at these uh, horsemen what they look like what in the mindset of that of that people would stand by the cathedral and look at this thing they, they, they would look at those statues and they would think they were living those living beings that they they saw crossing the streets on their war horses on this massive animals covered in iron and capable of, of massacring everyone, right? Until also a greater force from the people began to put a uh, break to that. Uh, and so what this broader ancestral symbol coming from the, the equestrian military culture of the Indo-European steppe had actually had been injected, had, had remained so uh, constitutively in, in the identity of these people. These are the same symbols. It's not the republican, it's not the democratic um, side of the story. This is about the faculty of rule over the world. Right? The, the dignified uh, humanity uh, through a, a transfiguring power of command. Right? That's what these people believed in. Primary. Right? Um, so um, there's so much more to that. But again, if you wonder why a, a country, again, it was not even unified, but began to, to spread, for example, the, the third classical language, the one of modern Europe, and dominating in every field of science, technology, uh, beyond, you named and low economy, etc. Look at what was happening here. There is a reason, maybe, and that reason does have to do with this dramatically intense military activity. So the commune needed the militas, and as it would have happened also later, um, they would repay them. Right? The militas had a prerogative. They, 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 uh, the, the everybody like in, in the exercitus communis had to provide for his own equipment, right? The commoner would have to. The milites were supplied by the rest of the community because that's how important they were. It's like in ancient Rome, right? You have been told uh, everybody participated to their means. Not really. The equites, the knights, surprise, surprise, were actually provided with extra equipment, with the same war horses, etc. Because the, they, they, the Romans, like everyone in the traditional, universal tradition, believed that it was something sacred in the mounted warriors, in the lords on horseback, and those who could afford that kind of, of moral and, um, and physical power to dominate such a force of nature, like a, like a stallion, like a war horse, um, and leaving also, according to the principle, that that experience dictated them, and, you, and that taught them how to, to handle the command of men as well in the process, right? Um, and so um, the commune offered the milites, and this is very docu very well documented, it's a macroscopic branch of communal historiography, um, offered to the milites uh, through their own conquests that were won also thanks to the people, to the, to the infantry, that also was something really the possibility of maintaining themselves, um, proceeding to raids, uh, the, the ransom of prisoners, um, and uh, the, that is also an issue. I mean, they were, of course, ransoming other militas that the, the other rich families of the other cities were to pay mo lots of money for, but also exempting the knights from some taxes famously enough, and destining to them uh, public goods, fiscal revenues, right? These people really controlled the commune because they had created it themselves, 
politically and institutional. Also, again, about this specific topic, n never underestimate how homogeneously intertwined the, the various communes were. You don't find uh, a structural systemic difference between these communes. Some were, of course, more powerful, less powerful, but they basically worked all in the same way. They knew each other, right? These people fought, again, with the, 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 the Italian districts were just not uh, larger, uh, wider than, let's say, some tens of kilometers. So also among the, the elites, they, they knew and they bordered like with other, I don't know, three or four districts at the same time. So they they knew each other. They knew the families that ruled in, in, in those other cities. They traded with them. They fought with them. And politics was always changing this, the alliances, etc. Because again, 30 cities concentrating here. By the way, these were considered one-fourth of Europeans at the time was Italian. And the majority was concentrated there. Uh, like in Lombardy and, and Tuscany. And still Italy, in fact, has the highest... Um, demographic concentration in Europe nowadays um, and and so just think about the like the, the force here like it's not another country that you have to cross a sea or or something the, these these forces are operating constantly everywhere around you so they put under they put you under a pressure in a f properly a, a, in terms of force and how how strongly it's exercising you that that brings you unavoidably to release the spring and carry out that struggle that we're talking about right so we tend to see just sometimes as historians do uh, like the the most tangible evidence like what do we know we need the proof we need the uh, the demonstration right so we look at written and verifiable procedures that the same communes proceeded to uh, to institute because again it was massive administration spreading right um, so processes that could allow um, uh, the the citizens to 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 see recognize their uh, their demands their rights because again these were free men remember that you don't find this elsewhere who lived within the city was a citizen had a had again some rights and progress. This is just like um, the 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 idea of citizenship too. Since Roman times, there is a strong bond here. It's all another world compared again to north of the Alps. Um, so this was a collective effort. It's the same word that the commune says, right? Um, everybody joined this massive contract for the benefits that had to be recognized. Right, uh, there are pacts, negotiations that um, were aimed specifically at reducing the private jur jurisdictions to create new uh, equal rules. Right, so that you have uh, you have equal opportunities, and then you can do whatever you want uh, with your outcome. And there's uh, there is a, a minority, but hegemonic quote in fact of the pop of the urban population that was setting this basis in order to obtain um, certain specific benefits and see um, saying recognized their old and new privileges at the same time because again these had belonged to the imperial administration as well namely uh, they as as families as individuals that had again ruled the country since centuries and that at this point they were putting each other in common literally to see such power maintained and, and augmented and enlarged um, and for one century again this system held that is to say it was so remunerating that even the rest of the people fundamentally wouldn't um, complain roughly there were, there were clashes within there were factions fighting against one another, etc. But there was not that that eventual further step of saying, okay, but then these privileges are too far because also the rest of the population has dramatically enlarged, wants them, or at least wants to 
like say a, a different order to be implemented for expanding or stabilizing the, the commune further. That's another thing that belongs to the, the popolo, etc. And we made videos about that. But again, it's crucial to assess this first military consular, consular foundation of the Italian commune and its deeper meaning, its deeper uh, function and the need that the people had to have this knights ruling the land and reaffirming and are actually implementing a, a type of, of, of administration, of, of, of government that had never up to that point seen before. Right? So this was a, a massive systematization of, of the various um, resources, of the various ambitions and um, opportunities, etc., that were trying, were um, presenting themselves uh, incredibly at this point in the Italian city-states as they were being formed. Again, this is a process, right? It's not yet... Um, this is still, um, say, an estate rather than a, uh, a state specifically, right? It's still, again, in fact, the consuls the, the, that surely in the first uh, communal era were, were seeing themselves still as knights, in fact, leaving making a contract with other knights and ruling the land. Later on, this thing would become kind of more of a state, right? Something that could be identified also institutionally, internationally, um, as also a source of, of, of law. And this is because, of course, the same community at a point had a descending phase and was taken over by other people around, that is, the, the lords, the other communes that were more powerful, that would create some regional states where gradually the various communes would maintain their autonomies but still were fundamentally brought under and they perfectly realized that but still they had given up right because especially since the people had taken over uh, it's true that the knights had at some point kind of too much of a violent lifestyle and, and uh, they were a close class more than else but and so the people at some point were were strong enough to force that, that, that divide at least. But and again, it's not the people like the shoemakers. It's a, we're talking about rich people, powerful people. It's like the the middle. It's like the the gentry in many ways. But um, still, um, the process of settlization, especially after the, the the crisis of the mid 14th century, is is deeply felt. There is all a, a different like an important change in the structure but th that's so late it's almost um, it's almost half a millennium later but uh, we will talk about that more at some point because again I already made videos about the crisis of the Italian communes but there is also something that fundamentally capitalizes on them right and uses them as stable bases of for of larger political territorial dominations right so this aspect is is really in my opinion one of the single most important chapters in medieval history and also in western history altogether telling the truth however for today i stop it here i just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you are interested in my upcoming content and for now i thank you heartily for listening to me i wish you a nice time and see you next time